Hey, um, thank you for coming. Welcome to this uh, second series of um, workshops that Platypus has organised um, different perspectives of, of, on the left, where we've just invited a series of different representatives from different groups to come and present their project to Platypus. Um, uh, and uh, with, with the idea of um, uh, utopia and um, pa pa program and utopia in mind as the theme of the conference, um, uh, we've, we've asked, asked the um, uh, representatives to uh, respond to that question a little bit in their remarks, but um, really it's just a chance for them to present their project. So I'd very much like to thank uh, John Beecham of the Party of Socialism and Liberation um, for coming today. Uh, he is on the Central uh, Committee of uh, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, um, and he's the Chicago Director of the Answer Coalition and the Midwest Organizer for the Party um, So um, basically, I'm going to give John about 30 minutes or less if you want to present the project of the PSL, and then I'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Um, if it's cool, I'm just going to start out with a little survey of the major. Uh, if you don't want to raise your hand, you don't have to, but I'm just wondering, just to figure out how to frame my remarks, how many people have heard of the Party for Socialism and Liberation? How many people have either read our program or feel like they're somewhat um, knowledgeable of who we are and what we stand for? Okay, so there's a couple. All right. So, I think what I'll do is I'll just, hopefully in a lot less than 30 minutes, um, just say who we are and what we stand for. I will, uh, I mean, I'll talk briefly about what we think the program is and maybe say a few things about Utopia. Um, for us, we have a program. There's a, there's a print copy on the table here. It's also available on our website at pslweb.org. The program is a product of uh, a uh, term of internal party discussion, and then uh, the product of discussion, debate, amendments, and ratification at a Congress that had a, uh, a Congress. We've had two Congresses now. Our first Congress is where one of the principal things we were doing was getting our program out there. And that, that Congress was, uh, um, well, was, there were elected delegates to that Congress and branches around the country. We have branches in a lot of the major cities, elected delegates to go to the Congress. So it was a process of internal democracy. But really, the program is for us, it's not for us. Uh, we have maybe what could be considered an old school approach to program. I don't know if that, maybe old school isn't the way to, to, to talk about it, I'm not sure. But that the program is really uh, a guide for the working class and the people of a particular country and because we're communists internationally as well to a certain respect, uh, uh, to political action, uh, political vision, and for the political transformation of capitalism into communism. It's, it's a document meant to help and facilitate, not necessarily the lecture, but help and facilitate the overthrow of the capitalist system. Uh, you know, it would make sense actually to really not, in some ways, not even have a program right now. Because the program doesn't really fulfill its purpose unless it becomes something where the masses themselves are reading it, are interested in reading it, and looking for, in a, during a crisis of capitalism, are looking for uh, basic ideas on how to com combat the system and overthrow it. So having said that, we have a program because we, it's our analysis, it's our perception, and we're a party of activists. We're out in the streets, we're in lots of different movements, that uh, the conditions in the United States even and around the world are such that the rebirth of the communist movement is highly possible. In fact, it's only during 
times of economic crisis and worsening conditions for workers and poor people that socialism becomes possible at all. And socialism really, uh, for us, it's a living thing, so it doesn't really become something until it is possible for it to be uh, something uh, generally taken up and struggled for. So that's why we have a program. We have a program because we believe, and it, I think it'd be wrong for us to prognosticate, we don't believe in prognostication, but that there is the possibility that there will be a rebirth of the communist movement in the world. And that's based on uh, decades of imperialist aggression and worsening conditions for people around the world. That there is no other recourse. If people are pressed, are pressed and, are, and have their backs up against the wall, there's no other uh, effective antidote. There are other antidotes uh, um, that we're not at war with or anything like that. But we believe that there is an effect. There's no other effective antidote than communism, and that would be the expropriation of the means of of the capitalist means of production, making them uh, public property and collectively owned, and uh, rationally planning an economy for people's needs. And so. Our program is very is very specific too. I mean, I'm not going to go through it. You should check it out. But we have one. It was a course of debate, and we suggest things. We suggest things based on the international situation and the domestic situation. But our starting point for all things that we consider and all all actions that we take and all programmatic precepts that we put forward, for lack of a better way of saying, it, is the international situation itself. Is the international relationship of forces the conditions for working and oppressed people around the world. Like for us, there's no separating domestic and foreign uh, policy or, or responses to imperialist policy, both domestically and foreignly. foreignly. Or, you know, is, uh, does, if you try to do that, it does great violence, it does great, well, violence is the right word, it does, uh, it, it, it does damage to the struggle if you try to separate those things. So, I mean, I could go into more specific things. I think maybe I'll just give a couple of examples uh, of what we actually do. I mean, based on our lineage in the movement, and I'm talking this way because I assume that there's many people here that, you know, there's some people that may be new to, to leftist politics. There may be some people who have been around a while. But, you know, our basic political approach comes out of a tendency within the United States where we see that, where we, uh, our analysis is that there are really two main camps in the world. When the Soviet Union still existed, and they, they were the Eastern European countries, uh, our approach to the world was an independent approach, like not adherence to any like socialist uh, or communist network. But that there was two main camps, the socialist, the socialist countries, the oppressed countries, and the workers and oppressed of the world, and on the other hand, the imperialists. So that is still, to this day, you know, our basic, it's oversimplified, yes, it's our basic approach. Every situation is different. And that's why, for example, in the case of Libya, recent cases of Libya or Syria, we are, you know, very heavily involved in opposing intervention in both those countries. And, you know, like in the case of Libya, take a, a very particular approach. Uh, we, we took the approach of, of course, being against war and U.S. and foreign intervention in Libya. And defending uh, the, the Libya, Libya from uh, imperialist intervention. But at the same time, um, not, and at the same time, being very firm about not participating in the racist demonization campaigns against Libyan leaders, including Muammar Gaddafi. That doesn't mean, and you won't find one scrap of, of, of uh, language in any of our literature saying that we supported Gaddafi, but that we took an approach that the imperialists were doing fine, and we always take this to the imperialists are doing fine in their demonization campaign, which is the basic way in which they try to get people here in the United States and in other imperialist countries to go along with the bombing, and that there is every need to resist that demonization campaign. And we feel that actually gives us the ability to talk in practical terms about what the Libyan state actually is, um, or was, under, under Qaddafi and under, under the leadership at the time. Um, any, other, you know, any other approach 
runs the possibility of having to actually mischaracterize what's going on on the ground in Libya. Like, the fact that a million people poured out into Tripoli a number of times against the NATO intervention and against the NATO bombing, and some of those people were supporters of Gaddafi's, but some weren't, um, is something that we could, you know, freely report as, look, this is a, this is, these are people that are willing to resist uh, NATO, and there's working people, there's poor people, there's women that are on the side of defending their government against imperialism. So when we take that approach, we can, t we can talk about that. Uh, we don't have to run away from that. And, you know, what this means is often, for example, we get, we've gotten called Saddam Hussein supporters, we are called Assad supporters, we were called Milosevic supporters, we were called Gaddafi supporters, so on and so forth, which is not true and which, you know, uh, having taken this position, that's going to be the weapon that's used to try to silence the position that we took, which was very simple. Anti-war, anti-intervention, no to the racist demonization campaign that's meant to be the hammer to destroy an entire country and reduce city to rubble and kill thousands of people. So I'm giving this example of Libya maybe because I'm just trying to say if the question is what is the PSL compared to other groups, I'm giving this example. And does this mean that we worked with and we were, you know, we pretty much were, you know, the most active mass organizers of protests against the Libyan war in the United States. And there were a decent number, there wasn't a huge demonstrations, but there were decent demonstrations, mostly African American people in the United States. And it meant that we worked with Cynthia, our principal allies were Cynthia McKinney and the Nation of Islam, which if you know the Nation of Islam, you know that they are Qaddafi supporters. It did mean that we, you know, we, uh, that was our coalition in order to defend you know, to, to, to uh, oppose, to actively oppose the war. And if you think about it, in the United States, being able to bring African American and anti-war forces together, and uh, many African Americans, and most of African Americans, Americans saw through exactly what the U.S. was trying to do in Libya, and most African Americans are against the United States and Britain and France recolonizing Africa. To bring those two forces together, there was no other path. We felt like there was no other path but that basic understanding of the situation, that political program, and joining with those, those allies. And for us, that's exactly what's needed. If you think back in the movement, if you think back, and we want to work with all those who want to oppose, oppose the war. It's not, it's not a sectarian principle. Everybody who came to the demonstration against the war in Libya, we wanted them to come and participate. But if you think back to the Iraq war, there was a mass outpouring in the United States. It was mostly anti-Republican and anti-Bush, but there were millions of people in the streets, and we were some of the we were like one of the main organizers of those mass anti-war protests. In those protests, every single group on the left came out on the street. Not every single group, I shouldn't say that. But mo the vast majority of groups came out on the street and helped organize those protests. For us, what, what we're saying is, is that if, even if there's not massive or opposition, or there's not large-scale opposition, or even semi-large-scale opposition in the United States, that that opposition is still necessary. And for a communist formation, what, what we need to be able to do is resist all of the um, pressure within the United States, the pressure to stay on the sidelines when the U.S. was bombing whole Libyan cities into the ground, and be silent to some extent. That there, you, we have to find that there has to be a way to be able to do that. Because look, no one in the United States is right now, for the most part. I mean, it does happen, but the chances of going to prison for being an anti-war organizer are not that high. If the stakes are higher in an imperialist war or an inter-imperialist inter war, the chances that anti-war organizers will be faced with prison sentences and other forms of repression are very high. And, and, and during those times, the same types of pressures that happen, are happening uh, during the Libyan war and now are happening in Syria are going to be greatly amplified. And if there isn't a formation in the United States, if there aren't groups in the United States that can stand up to that pressure and navigate away to still counter all of imperialism strategies in order to strengthen their grip 
on the world and on the Middle East, uh, you know, then, then we have no way of expanding the resistance against imperialism and expanding the resistance against the capitalist system. Now, how much time did I take? Um, I mean, you've, you've taken about 15 minutes. Okay. So, um, you know, I, brought, I bring up Syria and Libya just for a very specific reason. You know, because in a way, those are litmus tests of leftists and socialists right now in the United States. Like, what, uh, you know, the main program internationally of the United States is to, is to um, reinstitute a new Middle East that's firmly under their grasp. And the reason for that is, is that it's a center of world trade. It's an area of great natural resources, oil and natural gas, the Middle East and Central Asia. And if the United States, if Wall Street doesn't control and dominate that area, which is right in the middle of Afro-Eurasia, where 85% of the world's population lives, then, then, the, then Wall Street has no way to dominate the world. Like, it's not a choice. Central command of the US military is in the Middle East for a very specific reason. Because if they don't dominate that region, they can't be the most powerful country in the world. And dominating that region allows them, in their minds, allows them to to keep their position in the world. And everything, every single thing Wall Street does is not just based on the domestic market, it's based on the entire global market and keeping US hegemony in the world and in the global market. And if they can dominate that region of the world, they can also, any opposition to them, any military or political opposition to them, can be, they can, they can more easily uh, deter and wipe out that opposition because they can just turn off the energy resources it takes to uh, put tanks and put planes and put ships in the battlefield. So for us, it's not like separate from the struggle how best from, from within the United States, the most powerful, where the most powerful capitalist class exists, how to resist domination of the Middle East. Um, and so that's why I put that forward. But at the same time, there's great possibility here in the U.S., we believe, for reviving the communist and social struggle, and just reviving struggle in general. We believe that, in a lot of ways, we are starting from scratch. And I, don't, I think this is an objective assessment, in a way. The capitalist crisis that just started in 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008, it's a severe crisis. It's a pro and in many places outside the United States, it's a project protracted, deep, and painful crisis. Like, for example, in Greece. There has been no large-scale mass international movement to counter that, which is what is greatly, what, which what is, is greatly needed. However, the Occupy movement, the uprising in Madison, and even the Chicago teacher strike uh, are signs that there is, there is the possibility for struggle to break out and to become something that sweeps, sweeps the landscape and sweeps people up into it. And we have seen over the last decade or so um, a definite growth in the amount that young people are interested in leftist ideas or interested in socialism and communism. I mean, our party, our tendency has grown more in the last 10 years than it did in the last 20 years before that. And our party has significantly also grown. It's been mostly young people, people from the Latino community, people from the Af young people from the African American community. So there is that. Our our approach is we're trying to build a party that's based in struggle, both domestic and foreign, while at the same time uh, rebuilding the communist movement in the United States. And we believe that, and I'm not going to elaborate much on this, but we believe that building a party, building an organization, is a very uh, integral part of rebuilding the communist movement. Our adversaries are well organized and centralized, and you know we don't believe that it has to come in any old form. And the arguments between Trotskyists and Maoists and Stalinists and the and the old socialist groups to us are important. People should know them, but you know we're in a new period. I don't think they, we don't think things should be reliant upon that. We need to find new ways of re-sparking the conversation of building the type of communist movement when an economic crisis does happen that can effectively, um, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, 
help harness uh, new movements, help, help new movements, I wouldn't even say harness, help new movements in the direction of building powerful mass movements and powerful organizations that can take on the capitalist establishment, that beat off, that can beat back an austerity and imperialist war, but I mean, we want to win. We want to defeat the capitalist system, expropriate the means of production, and set society on a, on a new path. It's, at this point in history, it's totally possible. We can produce a lot more than we're producing. We can take care of people's needs. The break on that is the fact that it's all, the means of production are all centralized under capitalist ownership. That needs to be smashed, for lack of a better, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to say that in a stereotypical way, but that needs to be done away with, and, and you know, a new type of society needs to be instituted. But we definitely believe that that new, that new society can't be instituted unless there is a well-trained and experienced fighting force. I mean, how, how else could that happen? I mean, how else, I mean, you know, our, our foes are serious, they're well-organized, and they, they have a lot, you know, they have a lot of power. So I think, um, I'll, I'll stop there with just saying one more thing. I mean, all this means that we're involved in all the different struggles that we can be. Um, of course, just like any organization, we think deeply about what we should be doing at any time, and we, you know, have discussions about it. But, uh, you know, we're, a lead, we're in the, you know, leaders of the anti-war movement, we're in the immigrant rights movement, we're in the LGBT movement, we're in the women's movement, we're affiliated with a women's organization. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time in solidarity with Venezuela and Cuba, you know, the, 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 the council, the Venezuelan consulate, you know, comes to our office every now and then, like we just held a meeting after Chavez's death, you know, what's next for Venezuela. Um, you know, people from our party just went down to Venezuela in an international delegation to see how we can help. Um, there's lots of different things. There's, besides publishing newspapers, we have a regular newspaper, we have books, um, we have a radio station. Uh, it's called Liberation Radio. I mean, it's, it is actually carried on some radio stations, um, but it, it, it just started. It's like on a pod. You guys have to help me out. I think it's like podcasted, so you can listen to it on the internet. It's weekly. It's called Liberation Radio. We produce it ourselves. And we're very serious about not just struggling, but um, we are embarking on a serious project of, 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 of having a sort of like a holistic, I don't know if that's the right word, like communist school. Like, you know, we're working to put lots of different educational programs and videos like on the internet where people can actually go through a whole series of classes, for lack of a better word, um, because that's what, like I said, we want to win, but the consciousness that we need to overthrow the system and form organizations and movements to do that, it's not something that necessarily workers and oppressed, you know, are born, you know, you're not necessarily born, like I wasn't born into it, like my dad's a tea party, right, so, I mean, but some people are born into it, like I have a son, maybe I guess he's born into it, he can do whatever he wants, by the way, I'm not going to force him to be in the party, he's not, he, He's too young to be in the PSL. But um, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>
clear about starting with the international situation is just because because of where we live. Um, you know, one of the main devices they have against us is just racism and chauvinism, just saying, you know, the thing where the U.S. should and has the right to intervene in other countries, including economic sanctions, which kill people, bombing campaigns, full-scale invasions, and just straight-up racist depictions of other countries, people, and, and leaders. Um, that's a very serious impediment to regular, even poor working people in the U.S., even, even oppressed people in the U.S., that's a very you know, significant, who understand, who, who have, you know, the basis which to understand this um, situation better than, you know, someone that works, lives in a middle class neighborhood, perhaps. But that's a very, very, um, you know, serious impediment for people's consciousness. The idea that somehow American is, a, American has some, some form of exceptionalism to it. And it comes in all stripes, right? Um, but that is something that they really try to just drill into us, you know, that, America can't, you know, we believe that literally it would be almost inconceivable for the United States to do anything <laughs> progressive in the world at all. Are we totally ruling it out? I mean, that would be unscientific. But the, the U.S. as, a, as an economic uh, structure is completely predicated on, on dominating <coughs> the rest of the world. And, you know, uh, Pre preserving and expanding U.S. hegemony. So based on that, you know, I mean, are we going to like tell people they shouldn't take U.S. food aid if it, you know, it comes to them? I mean, no. But that food aid, that doesn't make that food aid coming from a, it's not coming from a progressive vantage point. I mean, people are hungry, should get food anyway, right? So that's, that's where, that's for us, we don't think that like, there's no genetic difference between people in the United States and the rest of the world. I mean, there's no reason why people in the U.S. can't struggle against the system or, or can't figure it out or don't have the will or determination, especially the most poor and oppressed in the United States, can't find the will or determination to take on their oppressors. I mean, you know, this country used to be a slave country. Slavery was defeated by slaves and freed blacks uh, joining the... Union cause, risking 2,000 of them risked their lives in the Union Army, even though it meant that they were going to be ill-treated by the Union Army, and then if they were captured by the Southern Army, that they would be executed on the spot. In other words, 200,000 people knew they were going to be cannon fodder and had to win, or they were going to die, or they were going to die on the spot. Nonetheless, they did that. That happened in this country. Apartheid in the South was defeated. The rule of the Klan was defeated in the South through the organizing of African American people. And we're talking about, besides the native people, the poorest and most oppressed people in the country. And that happened, that happened here, and other movements have happened here. We don't think there's any impediment. Like, there's workers and oppressed people, like, aren't the students. The middle class people, you know, people aren't the impediment. You know, capitalism is, and imperialism and racism play a very specific function in the, in the United States. So that's why we, you know. Okay, so... I don't know your name, sorry. Um, we know each other. <laughs> so, our country has been tolerable of having communism and socialism in not only politics, but just accepting that concept that there's so communism, socialism, and put in our society. You alluded this a little bit in your own statement, your opening statement. I mean, is there this revival of communism, socialism in our country? If so, is a brand new school of thought, just like the Frankfurt School kind of changed what neo Marxism is and everything. Is there a whole new outlook of what communism and socialism means? Is there a redefinition of that? Um, if so, why not keep some of the old ideals of what communism and socialism used to be? Go ahead and answer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a rebirth of the. I mean, I, I don't think what's happening in the United States, you could really say there's like a, but there is a rebirth of, of activism. There's a rebirth of, I mean, you know, political organizations are growing in the United States. I mean, that's, that's happening. I mean, what I would mean about the rebirth of the communist movement, it's like, 
you know, only really one time in the U.S. has there been a communist organization where a, a large percentage of the, or a decent percentage of workers and poor people look to them, right, for help, for organization, for guidance. I mean, that was the Communist Party during the 20s and 30s. Um, there, that that was a, that was. I mean, they were able to organize people, and they were organizing people on, you know, a fairly like internationalist revolutionary outlook. Um, I mean, the question about old and new is, oh, it, you know, it's always very important. I mean, for us, we think we're, we think, you know, that that the communist movement needs to be reborn, re-energized, for lack of a better word. And I mean, you should read our program. I mean, it's not. You know, it's 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 fairly like, for lack of a better word, it's fairly programmatic. It's like, this is capitalism, and this and and this is this is what would be possible under socialism. I mean, we don't I, we're not trying to dictate to people what should happen under socialism. But for us, communism is the simple, the simple thing, is that the means of production needs to be need to be expropriated, and there has to be a struggle in order to do that, and then society needs to be reorganized on the basis of producing for people's needs. And and then after a revolu if a revolu communist revolution were to happen, then there would be a an, probably an extended period of still struggling. Old ideas, old ways, the capitalist class, a lot of them would still be around. Um, and so there would be there would still be there would be a need for there would still be a need for social organization. Uh, in order to secure the gains that had been won through any revolution that would happen in the United States. I mean, that's, it's really not any more complicated than that. It's like, we make a lot of food, people should be able to eat, people should be able to go to education free. If someone's sick, they should be able to get medical treatment. And the only way we can guarantee that is if production is in the, is in the hands of the people. I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's still a relevant Okay, um, so you, you briefly mentioned the lineage of your party, and I'd be very interested in hearing you talk more about that. My, my understanding is that the PSL came out of the Workers' World Party, which came out of the SWP, and correct me if I've been misinformed. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing you talk about uh, how you see those, those splits and the politics behind them as significant today. Or if you don't. Yeah, I mean, that's true. Like and that the what I I didn't give the name but it's the name for our general international outlook is the global class camp strategy for lack of a better and a guy named Sam Marcy was instrumental in developing that and he did it while he was in the Socialist Workers Party and some of the branches of the Socialist Workers Party left and formed Workers World Party uh, I was in the Workers World Party some of us left uh, seven years ago now I think I have it right seven years ago now. Uh, and, you know, we didn't talk about it much at the time. You know, really small organizations, uh, you know, let's be honest, I mean, most of the socialists and communists and other leftist organizations are fairly small, especially based on the task. And, you know, we didn't think, we felt because there, there was a lack of internal democracy at the time, that we couldn't work out our differences, that there was new possibilities that hadn't been around for decades as far as, like, building a party. Um, and, and, and aiding the struggle that we needed to work out these differences at the time. We were unable to work them out, so we just decided to amicably split and form a new party. I mean, since then we've grown exponentially. We have chapters in five times as many places as we did when we started. Um, and our emphasis was not towards the party split, but towards the masses. We felt like we were, we were involved in mass organizations, um, and we wanted to be um, a little more organized in the way that uh, we built our party and built the movement. Um, you know, I mean, the specific differences we had politically with them, I mean, you know, to most working people, if you went to Workers' World Party's website or our website, or maybe even Fightback's website, you know, you would see that, you know, you may not, I mean, who would really be able to tell the difference? You'd have to know, like, what we decided to do. And I'll give you a good example, because the elections are always a good example of where parties stand. We run our own, in 2008, 2012, we ran our own candidates for president, didn't attack Obama, straight as a person, right? Because our, our, 
you know, our approach is always one that's in the moment and practical, right? It's not like we didn't oppose this policy or oppose the Democratic Party, but black people in the U.S. would have also taken our attacks as attacks on them. You can't, there's no way to say that's not, you know, in our assessment that that's not true. And we go out campaigning. We talk to people, you know what I mean? And we talk to people in all the neighborhoods. That's the basic assessment of African American people in the U.S. Is that all of, all of the attacks against Obama are racist and directed at him. But, so, but nevertheless, the Democratic Party and President Obama, it's a capitalist party. Republicans are capitalist party. So we run our own candidates in a way where we positively affirm our program and a socialist program, a revolutionary program to overthrow the capitalist system. Workers World Party um, in 2008 supported Cynthia McKinney, which we supported too. But then after the election was over, self-criticized and says they should have supported Obama. Uh, Freedom, Road, F Freedom Road Socialist Organization was kind of like us too. They, they put out a big thing in the elections and say, defeat the right, which means defeat the Republicans. They don't support the Democratic candidate, but they tell all their members to go around helping to get the Democratic Party elected. So for us, that, the, main, the main difference with us and Workers' World was over that type of approach uh, to the struggle, in our, of the struggle in oppressed communities. Like, you know, our, struggle, our, our approach is the same. We believe rate, um, the struggle against capitalism in the U.S. has to be a struggle against racism. Like, there's no way of separating it. But when you get down to it, there were three different, appro there were three different approaches. Those were practical things. And to me, that's the best way to explain what our differences are and the reason why we, besides the fact that we very much believe that there has to be internal democratic discussion as much as possible, as much as a revolutionary organization can have. Like, we have elections. Like, I'm on the Central Committee. I was elected. Gabe, so? Yeah, so to pick up on the electoral, on your orientation toward electoral politics, yeah. uh, in what way are the differences between PSL and these other groups, which might have slightly different lines or some critique Obama, some don't, some whatever. In what way is that relevant? Sorry, can I just, can, can people at the back here, could you like sort of speak yeah. up a bit? In what way are these differences and orientations toward electoral politics relevant to your program to, uh, you know, re make revolution? Yeah. Or, because like, you could just say like, okay, you all have different, there's different perspectives on, uh, you know, whether or not we should critique Obama or how we should critique Obama, right. but it doesn't seem like, so where's the program for revolution? Right, right. And where's the difference in program for revolution among these parties? Right. Yeah, I mean, the elections are a sham. I mean, they're completely, and for the capitalists, they're a device to actually sideline struggle, sideline alternatives to their system. I mean, that's consciously the way they use it. Our approach to the elections is, why not, it boils down to this, is why not run into the elections if the capitalists have the playing field and they're going to be able to like dominate the political discourse which is what happens in the United States why not enter into the elections and bring up a program that says we should overthrow the entire system and just talk to people about it like literally running in the elections allows us to actually talk to people about that we, we talk to more people about that and recruit more members into our party during the election cycle than any other time and the simple reason is is because ballot access allows people to find out who we are. You know? And honestly, like, we don't, I mean, they don't care about elections. You know? I mean, the capitalists don't care about elections. If the elections don't work out in their favor, they just use other means. Th you know, 30% of the population still can't even participate in the elections in the United States. I mean, they're a complete sham. And, you know, we don't have any faith that, that you know, winning an election means anything in the United States. And we don't even run into, we don't, if we, if we won, we would take the seat, we would take the seat to do the same exact thing that we do outside of that seat, is to fight, this, is to fight the system. Okay? If, we, if we actually were able to take the seat, let's say a PSL member won mayor of Chicago, for example. It's probably not going to happen in the United States, ever. Maybe it'll happen like, you know, a, a, a socialist will be elected like two weeks before a revolution or something, but it's hyperbole. But why wouldn't we take that office and use it to fight the system? Okay. Pam, um, I had 
I guess a couple of questions. Um, you seem to be sort of going back between two two ways of thinking about this problem, I guess, and maybe you could clarify. One is what you've just articulated, like as, as long as we can talk to people about this or raise consciousness about this, like approaching it this way. But then you talked about your other work. You you said that you as an organization were leaders in the anti-bombing of Libya. You talked about the anti-war movement. And you called yourself a group of activists. And we're emphasizing that. You said that the Syria and the Libya situation posed a litmus test for the left. And um, But then you said that what the goal of your party was was to create an independent stance. OK. And then you went back, and I think you said something quite kind of revealing about the black people's perspective on Obama, and said that you understood that you didn't want to alienate yourselves from your constituency, and that their understanding of Obama right. and critiques of Obama was that any critique of Obama is racist. OK. So I think, like, in my own mind, as you're saying this, like, I said attack. attack on Obama is racist. Yeah. Okay. So I was thinking about how you create an independent stance within, let's say, the context of like Libya or Syria. Um, if in, in, you've articulated as like, well, we need to be on the side of weakening the imperialist powers, right? And so that's the side that you wanna that you wanna take, but. What does this actually mean? Like, what does this actually look like? like so, you know, because you mentioned about like political and military opposition to the United States, like would be like a kind of goal, something for the way in which you're dealing with this. But so, what would it have to look like to be politically effective? Why, why like, how? It seems to me that there's something else going on than simply having conversations with people that you. You seem to say that there are these movements out there, and you, the job of your organization is to support these movements. But again, how does that action support an independent stance? What's the relationship between like the issue of raising consciousness among people towards the direction of like a socialist transformation of society, and your activity as part of the anti-war movement, Libya campaigns, and this idea of supporting movements that are already there? I mean, for me, it's just we organized a national ongoing campaign to stop the bombing of Libya. We had emergency demonstrations. Uh, we, Cynthia McKinney went to Libya a number of times. We had a national tour with her. We had a demonstration at the White House. We had a demonstration in Parliament to stop the bombing of Libya. At the same time, we had in-depth political analysis, news analysis. I wrote a couple articles that were read by thousands of people that went deeper into the situation. And, but we did that as people who were actively opposing the bombing, right? So now, the demonstrations were the most. There's a couple thousand people in Harlem and there's about 500 in DC. When we had an emergency protest here in Chicago, there was like 80 people, right? And then, you know, I mean, let's be like, you know, we shouldn't exaggerate stuff. We had articles on our website that were probably read by a couple thousand people. Maybe they got a, a little, larger play. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, those two things aren't mutually exclusive to me. Those are, those are, those Yeah, are, I was asking you about the relationship between them, which I'm not right. quite, like, so the articles that you were putting forth right. in your website, et cetera, are right. these then, like, the material that creates an independent stance that you right. see as absent? Like, because you clearly have said, like, there's this absence like we need to start over and you know okay. so we have to but then you say also we have to support movements that are out there where we play a position of leadership okay so let me just ask it this way what yeah. does leadership mean in this situation what does it mean to yeah. be a leader of the anti-war movement of this right. living what kind of leadership are you providing for those movements i mean we just we feel like it's just having a clear idea of what uh, should be done and having the organizational capability to do it in a non-sectarian way where we help organize all the for all the people, all the forces that can be organized. I mean, that's our that that's our approach. I mean, it's you know I, I try to give a specific example in the case of Libya. Um, you know, I'm not sure how, how else to to uh, I'm not sure how, how else to characterize it. 
I mean, when I say independent, yeah. um, I'm not sure what you're referring to what I said. I mean, I, I, our tendency was to be independent of the, say, of the, of the Communist International and of the Fourth International and even of, I mean, uh, of, of China, right? It's like, you know, there are other organizations that were affiliated, networks that are affiliated with those different uh, countries, for lack of a better way to put it. All I meant to say is that we, our hallmark has been independent and supportive, militantly supportive, but independent, you know, ideologically. You know, I mean, that's just a basic, like, human simple thing, right? The reason why they're all different perspectives and all different parties is because we have different approaches and different ideas. But see, you, you seem to play down, sorry, last, last thing that I will yeah. say, okay, yeah. and, you know, we can move on, but you talk about these differences as practical things. You, earlier yeah. when you talked about the splits in the WWP, it, you talked about the splits in the SWP as like very practical things. You ended amicably, you decided that you wanted a different approach, and yet your emphasis on consciousness and leadership, like, these sorts of articulations seem to me to say at least that like these splits inform what kind of leadership you are providing for these movements, and so they don't seem to just be technical. And so I am pulled in two different directions in your presentation. Is that you know the general sort of sense that that on the one hand it's very difficult. There needs to be consciousness raising. You clearly, because you just articulated yourself from an earlier from a previous party, think that that is not an adequate way of dealing with that problem. So you have a better way of dealing with that problem. Yeah. But you seem to have articulated that way, that better way is simply supporting what's already there. Yeah, I mean we, I mean. Uh, we can be separate from other organizations, but I mean, our, you know, we'll have debates with other organizations in our newspaper and our paper sometimes. I mean, our new book, which unfortunately I don't have, Socialist in War, talks about the ISO's approach to the anti war movement, for example. And we've had back and forth with UFPJ, if you know who that is, and other, but our general approach is only to do that when it's necessary and not to do it in a, um, a lecturing, sectarian, uh, you know, sort of non-helpful way. I mean, I, I'm, you know, our approach to the split with the Workers' World Party is, hey, we're two small groups. Our pro we want we want to reach out to the masses. What good does it help if we, like, open up an attack on Workers' World Party? What good does that do the struggle? I mean, for us, the conclusion was it doesn't, and that's why we really, really wanted to stay. I mean, serious communists think very, very hard before they split with anyone. Splitting should never be the first option. Weakening, or we're very firm believers in organization. How else are we going to win unless we have organization? There's always a struggle, though. There's always a struggle between, like, which direction your organization should go in, you know, how you organize internally, how your approach is externally, and what you end up doing. There's no utopia. There's no perfect purity in any of this stuff. It's all a struggle uh, to build to build a party and to build some type of cohesive organization that can overthrow the system. But in that particular situation, we didn't feel like it was going to help anyone, including you guys here. I mean, you know, to attack an organization that we work with. But we felt like we couldn't stay in the organization. And I gave a practical example because for us, politics is about what you, you know, it's about Marxism is about what you do. Marxists are as what, as, you know, Marxists are, you know, judged on what they do. I mean, that's political activity. Uh, James? Uh, yeah, um, I kind of want to maybe I'll go push, push back on the Libya stuff a little bit. I mean, I, and that's, I, I agree with you that they're, that's certainly coming out with this, or whatever, stop the bombing, um, lie, and just, you know, troops out, whatever, have whether there are troops involved. Or it still seems to be a matter of national security, actually, but there you go. Um, I think I, that is a litmus lit test to a point. And um, uh, it, it should be phrased that way because, in that sense, we, uh, I am Britain, but yeah, we were, you know, if anything, more heavily involved in Libya than the States. And uh, um, it's, it's clearly a question of, like, or are you, so, or are you in, so, do you consent to the sort of exploitative operations of, uh, of your own state or not? I kind of agree with that. I think that once you get to this, sort of the other side of it, that, you know, well, Dig it, as you say, digging into things more deeply, writing sort of more theoretical, historical articles. So it seems to me that then the 
the, the, the line of like, well, we can't be seen to be joining in with uh, imperialist criticism of Gaddafi or, or whatever, in, that, in the sense that it's, I'm sure well, it is racist, uh, uh, but um, I, I think that it then becomes an option. I don't see how you can, I mean, I haven't read your material on it, so I, I don't know if this is a you know, fair, but it seems to me that you can't um, address the, 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 the actual situation on the ground in Libya um, during during the course of that conflict, the way that the forces arose, without um, pay, uh, without addressing, for example, the fact that for the seven years previous to, to, to the sudden switch of route, uh, Libya had been effectively a client state of the West, um, but without pointing, uh, pointing to the, the, the way that it is uh, regime treated sort of left wing opposition to it. Um, uh, and and so on, um, which at that point you're necessarily being critical because they're coming out in a paper with a party for socialism and liberation on the front of it, and it doesn't seem very socialist or liberatory to be a, a Western client state. So it's the same with uh, Saddam Hussein. I don't see how it's joining in with a, you know, a, in that sense, an inevitable racist campaign against Arabs and sort of mad Muslim terrorist bombers to um, you know, point out that, you know, quite well, Sadly, the same slaughtered, uh, massacred the Iraqi Communist Party, and uh, the Americans didn't complain there. So these these are uh, these are serious propaganda points. So uh, it seems to me that uh, being I, I, being too kind of uh, I'm not sure what the word is, but sort of uh, resistant to to kind of um, seeming to be singing this from the same hymn sheet. Is necessarily the kind of the best way because, as, as you say, these are international problems. We should start from the international situation, uh, but the international situation will look very different to people who are you know, left, uh, communist suppressed um, in a regime like Gaddafi's or even Assad's, where uh, they haven't had a very good time with it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the imperialist slogan was down with Gaddafi. And that was their basic slogan to mobilizing people for the U.S. participation in the bombing campaign, for the U.S. support to the anti-government fighters. Um, you know, we're not sure what's gained from putting the same slogan as a headline on our newspaper. Um, you know, like down with Gaddafi or down with Assad, which is, you know, some, some groups do put those headlines on their newspapers. Some groups do have that as their... Uh, um, program. Um, we didn't. We don't characterize Gaddafi as a client state. Actually, it's pretty clear that the, the U.S. Uh, never really uh, trusted the Gaddafi regime. Uh, all the rhetoric coming out of the Pentagon and Washington in the run-up to the war and the few years before that was that there was a danger of a, a, a resource nationalism a resurgence of resource nationalism coming out of Libya. Uh, it is true that the Qaddafi government uh, was making overtures to the U.S. and Britain and the imperialist powers. In, in other words, in a, in a certain set of world relations where the U.S. is greatly powerful and bombing entire countries out of existence and taking, overthrowing their governments and taking over the country, not just Libya, but many other governments have sought to Right to to uh, to negotiate with the United States in a way to try to get the U.S. not to do the same to them. For us, the biggest lesson is is that if you're not a straight up servant of Washington, then you are a subject of regime change and subject to be targeted, targeted, personally assassinated, and for the entire country to be uh, annihilated. If you look at the example of North Korea. I think North Korea is taking this lesson to heart right now. The United States and South Korea are engaged in extremely aggressive military exercises that are, that are simulating the nuclear destruction of North Korea. And North Korea has been the subject of economic sanctions, embargoes, and military threats. And the goal of the United States government is to overthrow the North Korean government. In response, North Korea has looked around the rest of the world and said, you know what? Even making deals with the imperialists is not working right now. The fundamental relationship of imperialism to the Middle East and to the rest of the world is you either go down on your knees 
and become an absolute client state, or we will we will bomb you into submission, we will invade your country, and we will take your country over. That is the real battle lines in the world right now. That's not made up. For us, that's a concrete assessment. So anything, any slogan that we put forward in that basic relationship, uh, we want to put it forward as a means of struggling against imperialism. So we see no need to join uh, the demonization campaign. And the problem with joining the demonization campaign, too, is that it doesn't, for us, it doesn't allow you to actually talk about the character of the Libyan state, that it was a product of a nationalist revolution that kicked the U.S. and British bases out of the country and set the, set the country on a path of being independent of imperialism. And there was a period of decades where the Libyan government supported movements all around the world against imperialism. And there, are still, there were gains based on that nationalization that the people of the country still benefited from. All those gains are all gone. Like, for example, getting a check in your mail from the oil revenue, which Libyan citizens did, that's not going to happen anymore. Going to school for free, that's not going to happen anymore. Most of the Libyans in the United States, or many of the Libyans in the United States that were part of the, the apparatus to support the bombing campaign, a lot of them were going to school for free, and it was being paid in the United States, and it was being paid for by the Libyan government. For us, that's just, just is not, or not more important to talk about, what the real stakes are for the Libyan people and having their country destroyed. I mean, there was a big mass demonstration here, 15,000 or more people against NATO when NATO met in Chicago. The organizers agreed to be silent about Syria, didn't talk about Libya, and even didn't talk about Iran. They did so on the basis of that, of the same thing. We can't do that, right, because, because we need to somehow speak truth about Qaddafi or we can't be seen as like, you know, supporters of Qaddafi or supporters of Ahmadinejad or anything like that. For us, it's not, there's no need to be seen as that at all. All you got to do is say, hands off Syria and Iran, paint that on your banners, hand out leaflets that say that. And at the same time, right, that, that, and that's the issue too. NATO and the U.S. are meeting here and their main targets are Syria and Iran and a few other countries. If you don't, you know, for us, it's just as simple as that. We might agree on many other things, but it's as simple as that. How are, you, how are you going to be able to, how do you put yourself in a position where you're able to raise those banners? And for us, it's not that complicated. And I understand where people are coming from, but if, you know, saying down with Gaddafi or down with Assad allows you not to raise those banners of, of hands off Syria and Iran, when there is a mass anti-war demonstration and NATO is meeting just down the street, you know, then that's a, for us, that's, you know, that's a problem. We're still going to march with you. We still want to march with you. But when I say independent, that's what I mean. That is a concrete example when the Answer Coalition were the only ones to raise hands off Iran and hands off Syria banners in a mass demonstration. We marched with everyone else. We were involved in that movement. We didn't antagonize the organizers. We just had different leaflets, a different website, and different banners. Banners that spoke to the immediate need of opposing NATO at that particular time. That's what I mean by being, by the necessity of, I mean, look, I don't have any desire to be independent of organizations or fight other well-meaning people or progressives. It's not about fighting people. It's, it's, it's that independent position is, for us, is correlates to what's needed in order to liberate ourselves from capitalism. Um, so uh, we have about 20 more minutes and I have four people down at the moment uh, to speak. So first, Nick. Uh, you mentioned Greece as an example where a crisis has struck hard. Uh, in what way do you think that uh, organizing strikes in the uh, USA against, uh, for example, European Union or Germany's policy against uh, Greece will uh, contribute to radicalizing struggles in Greece. Since past year, the anti-war movements did manage to stop uh, imperialist intervention. Uh, should left uh, in stru being struggles affected today? Yeah. Uh, so there's two questions, right? The one about Greece and the one about uh, interventions not stopping the imperialist war. Yeah, and if uh, left uh, today should be affected. Yeah. I mean, 
there were millions of people in the streets against the Iraq War, and the war wasn't stopped. If we be the truthful, be truthful, I mean, you know, we were very doubtful that we were going to stop the Iraq War. We felt that it was necessary in order to try to stop it, right? In order to stop imperialist war right now, I mean, some serious struggle has to be going down. I mean, soldiers have to be unwilling to fight. There has to be uh, a destabilization of the system. I mean, workers have to be struggling against the system here. I mean, the United States is the most powerful country in the history of the world. And they're not really challenged in any uh, measurable way right now. The only thing that can challenge them are the billions of people who have it in their interest to challenge the system. And if those people aren't in motion in a particular way, it's very difficult to stop the imperialist war. Having said that, the fact that there was massive opposition to the war changed the way the imperialists are carrying out their interventions. They've decided that they can't launch full-scale ground, uh, ground, full ground invasions now. They have to do it through other means. Now, it's still the same goal. They're still working in the same goal, and they're still using some of the, some of the same devices. But like the full-scale ground invasion is not something that they're, they've decided that they're going to reorient themselves towards not risking them. So mass struggle can make the imperialists, right? It can make them change. Now, now, mass struggle can also defeat it. Mass struggle can defeat an imperialist war. The, the war in Vietnam was defeated by the Vietnamese people, U.S. soldiers who are unwilling to fight, and an anti-war movement here in the United States. Like that, that was what, it was basically, basically the Vietnamese people. So, I mean, most demonstrations that we undertake, many of them, especially in this period right now, are not necessarily going to uh, achieve their goal. I mean, let's be, let's, let's be honest. But if they don't happen, then we're certainly not going to change our goal. The worst thing that could happen in the world is that the imperialists gear up for war and there's no resistance in the United States. If there's no resistance in the United States. The other question was, the other question was about, about Greece. There, were, there, there have been some small, like Occupy had a few actions in solidarity with Greece, and we participated in them. You know, the situation in Greece, um, I mean, things are horrible for the people of Greece. I mean, things are horrible for workers and the people of Greece. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the, the economic conditions and, and the attacks on workers and, and the, the austerity attacks. Um, and they've created a real, I mean, there is a real crisis in Greece where the massive, mass amount, the, the, the majority of the population is willing to go out on the streets and struggle to stop austerity. I mean, whole political parties have virtually gone out of existence in Greece. And in Greece, you know, there is, there are different leftist organizations. There's, I mean, there's different ones besides that, but there's Syriza, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and there's, there's also the Communist Party of, of Greece. Um, and neither one, neither, the, for us, the job of communist is to use a crisis in order to, if it's possible, and it's not, I don't think it's correct for someone from the United States to tell people in Greece what to do, right? I mean, they're there, they're on the ground. But if it's possible to use a crisis to overthrow the system, a crisis where people are clearly saying, this, this type of economic model, this type of economic program is directly harming us, and is, and is making us suffer, and we want something else. Um, you know, for, for Syriza is, I'm not anti-Syriza, right? And let me just say that is, but the problem with Syriza is it's a, co it's a broad coalition, and one of the organizing uh, uh, principles of that coalition is really to negotiate, to stop the austerity, which obviously I agree with, and to negotiate a better deal within the EU. The problem is, is as long as Greece stays in the EU, uh, Greece will feel the effects of any economic crisis like they just have within the European Union, because capitalism is not a system of equality, and that includes between countries. The more powerful countries within the EU are going to use the EU to exploit the less powerful economies. That's why Greece and, the other, and, and a few other countries are feeling the extent of that. So the Communist Party is advocating uh, getting out of the EU and also 
you know, also having a new type of economy, a new type of government. But the, the one thing about the Greek Communist Party is that they've also adopted the old sort of anti, they're anti-Syriza. Like part of their program is also, right, denouncing Syriza as part of the problem. The problem with that is, is for the Greek Communist Party, is that most of the, the vast majority of people are against austerity but not necessarily want to leave the EU because the United States, Britain, and Germany, and the Greek elite have all battered people with what, hap what will happen to you. You know what will happen to you if you leave the EU? You think it's bad now? Just wait. We will completely cut you off. Life as you know it will basically cease to exist, right? So the Greek Communist Party has to find a way or other, some other formation of maintaining that principled strategy, which is the way out for Greece and the way out for Greek workers, is, is leaving the EU, like disbanding the EU, abolishing the EU, while still finding a way of, of being with Syriza in the anti-austerity movement, basically saying to, saying to Greek people, we're with you in the anti-austerity struggle, but we also think we need to leave the EU. Are you following what I'm saying? So neither one of those groups, because of those things, have been, are, I mean, it's just clear that as of right now, hopefully this will change, have, have you know, been able to, and, you know, maybe it's not possible in the, you know, maybe it's, not, maybe it's definitely not possible in the basic circumstances that are happening. But it is a profound crisis, and it leads one to think, is there a possibility? Is there a possibility to overthrow the system? And whatever workers can do here um, to support, you know, Greek workers, I mean, we should we should do. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'll take two uh, final questions. Um, Gabe, coming back, and then Richard. Um. Okay. Uh, yeah. So there was during the Q and A, you said you were talking how it, I think you said there's probably never going to be a, you know communist elected mayor in the U.S. ever. And well, I, I shouldn't say that, but yeah. Right. Yeah. We, right. And so. Um, I was trying to be humorous, it right? But really also, work. but also, but also reflecting, right? So, yeah. so what does it mean to have a revolutionary party in the U.S. If you think that, uh, you know, what does it mean? You also said it, it's it, there's a way in which it doesn't make sense to have a program today, and so, but you have one because of you want to put forward your analysis, and so, uh, what is it? You know, how are you going to make your program realizable? If you think that on the one hand it doesn't make sense to have a program, and also yeah. revolution in the U.S. is impossible. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense to have a program. Obviously, we have one, but I think, but like what I was saying, for for me, the program is an actual political guide um, for workers, right? And in this, and in the specific circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, that's not necessarily going, like, the masses of workers right now are not going to take on the program of the Party for Socialism and Liberation as their program. So the reason why I pointed that out, I'm saying this is a program in, in advance, we're, we're putting this program now in, in the, because uh, we feel that the conditions are such that the, the rebirth of struggle and based on different signs that I talked about, the Occupy Movement and others, are totally possible. And that we want people to have something as like, as a, as not as an academic exercise, but as a practical example of what it would mean for people to have power, to take on the the existing structure and have power, like a like a program for. In other words, a program. We see the program as a program for mass struggle. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, what was the other part? Of, what was your first question? Well, right. I mean, it's a program for mass struggle, but yeah. It, and there's a way in which struggle is happening, but also there's a way in which revolution right. is never going to happen. So what kind of program is it? Oh, I mean, is revolution, did I say revolution is never going to happen? Well, you said, I was extrapolating, you said a, you said a, a communist would never be elected mayor. Well, yeah, but that's election's different than a revolution. I, I, I mean, I absolutely, I mean, there absolutely can be and should be and ought to be, and some, dare I say, will be a communist revolution in the United States. There's no other way, with with the with the type of societies we have and the economic forces in play, there's no other way for people to fulfill their needs and potentials under this system. It's not possible. We're always going to be people are always going to be butting their heads up against it. 
you know, it's been a long time since there's been a mass working class struggle and there's been mass communist or socialist parties in the United States. I mean, let's be honest about that. But that mean, that just all that means to us is that they're needed. You know, unless we have that t those type of organizations, we're going to keep getting beaten over the head. I mean, just outrageous things like them closing 54 schools in Chicago. I mean, like, how can they get away with just closing poor people's schools? I mean, it's just, it's just That's outrageously. Cri what it, what it is is because there's they? no. How can they? There's no social counterweight. There's no organizations. There's no, there, there's no social can, and those have to be developed. Those can't, like, like me sitting here in this chair or being a member of the Party for Socialism or whatever organization, right. I can't, like, magically wish that to happen. Right. The system is oppressive. It's closing people's schools. In that situation, you enter into the struggle and hope to, help to aid the struggle and build people's consciousness. That's how people learn. Like, for example, people in the Occupy movement at the beginning were, like, thinking the cops were part of the movement. Wait, so can I just... And it was, but many of them learned through the course of that struggle, in fact, most of the people in the Occupy learned that the cops are not part of that struggle. But there's no, there's no way you can learn that by, I, I, like, a communist, like, like, a communist like myself can't just go knocking on people's doors or speaking to groups of people and make that happen. There, we don't, we don't control the playing field, we don't control the playing field, but the playing field is inherently oppressive and attacks people if no one's struggling against it. So, but we're still in that process. The system, the ruling class is waging war on people and they're using the ex economic crisis to escalate the war. The people will fight back. People don't sit down forever and just let stuff happen to them. But we don't have like a magic button to do that. All we're, all we're for is entering that struggle and hoping to elevate that struggle to a general struggle against the system. And that's, that's difficult. That's not an easy task, but I, but like I personally, I don't see any other alternative historically. I don't see any. I mean, what else is the trajectory? Just having them keep impoverishing, impoverishing, impoverishing us. I mean, I'm a community college teacher. I have it better than a lot of workers because you know, I, I mean, I you know, I, I I I'm I'm at in the classroom less than other people. I mean, you know, teachers actually have to work really hard at this point. Um, but you know, every contract they keep telling us we got to make less money. More of us have to be part-time and part-time. You know, you have to work 80 hours a week as a community college teacher, an adjunct, literally to make like $25,000 a year, and you get no benefits, you know? I mean, and 30 years ago, that, it wasn't like that. 30 years ago, 80% of adjuncts had a full-time job with full benefits, and would work there, and only had to teach three classes a semester, or four classes a semester. There's only so long that people are gonna take that without fighting back. But we don't, but we can't, like, you know, we have the control we do. For us, that's why we have an organization, because an organization gives us more control over that situation than anything else. Yeah, I guess I have a few comments. One is, like, you talked about the ruling class, the mass protests affecting how the ruling class conducted the war. And I am old enough to remember when people were talking about the Vietnam Syndrome, and as far as I can tell, the Vietnam Syndrome over the last decade has been pretty effectively kicked. Nobody worries about the Vietnam Syndrome. People have gotten used to more or less, people have gotten used to more or less permanent, low-level warfare somewhere in the world, and exactly how it's conducted, it, that doesn't, and I mean, in the case, if you mentioned North Korea, which I thought is an interesting example. Now, I would agree, certainly, that although I consider North Korea a horrible dictatorship, that I certainly don't hold up as a model, that North Korea is not a capitalist society. I think that societies like Libya and Syria are entirely capitalist societies. And what is interesting right now is that basically the opposition to those Arab nationalist regimes, never been in Libya, but I have been in Syria before the Civil War, is coming from an Islamist right. And, and you, your organization, if I remember my history, eventually comes from a uh, split with the Workers' World Party and goes back to Sam Morris's global class war thesis, which I understand mm -hmm. made a certain sense at a certain point when you had the Soviet Union. Yeah. But I, I find it like hard when you're talking about the world, not maybe North Korea, but when you're talking about places like Syria, I don't see 
I mean, yes, okay, the imperialists may or may not intervene. I mean, there was a lot of criticism of Obama from Republicans about why bother, you know, in terms of Libya. I mean, there was a split in the Republican Party. So McCain was very interventionist. Other people were against it, including Sarah Palin. I mean, those are tactical questions, but I don't see how you can hold up these sort of nationalist regimes as in any way challenging global capitalism. Not even in some, in, in the way that you might hold up certainly the, the Vietnamese or the or North Korea as some kind of challenge, like what, what you think of that challenge, or what you think of the character of that regime as a separate issue. But just, just I don't see any, and, and you, you mentioned Greece. I mean, so if Greece leaves the EU, well, yeah, of course the Greek economy will be a mess. It, it won't even have to be something done to it by, by some deliberate policy. It'll just be a massive capital. Well, if, if, if the Greek, if Greek I mean, how, how, how right, does that even Greek, represent a progressive? Yeah. I mean, a progressive goal uh -huh. presumably be something that, at the minimum, would call for the abolition of overthrow of capitalism in Greece. But really, as a program, aren't you talking about realistically something that would aim for the abolition of capitalism in Europe? I mean, there was a slogan that you know used to be raised of the socialist United States of Europe. I mean, if, if you if you can't even put forward that as an idea, I think you're, you're endlessly stuck in, in a series of alternate dead ends. I mean, it's up to the Greece people to decide whether they want to stay in the EU. I mean, that's it's not up for me to, I'm not, to decide. I'm not saying... But the thing is, is like, how well, I mean, if Greece were to leave the EU, I mean, they would pretty much, you know, have to reorganize their economy on some other basis. You can advocate for leaving the EU and for socialism, for, for, for putting the means of production in the hands of, of publicly owned and for working people. I mean, you know, I'm not sure, like, um, you know, what's, what, like, for example, what other path, what other course there is for people of Greece. I mean, the question about, you know, whether you're staying in the EU or leaving the EU is, like, for me, it's just, like, pivotal importance. I mean, how can you stay in the EU if you're Greece and negotiate your way out of a capitalist system which will relegate you to, you know, as a, as a, as a smaller economy, as to the, the poorer economy? <laughs> That's exactly what's happened. I mean, you know, the, I mean, the, the question about, like, um, you know, Libya or Syria, I mean, Libya and Syria are capitalist countries. I mean, we're not upholding the Libyan regime or the Syrian regime as, as examples of anything. Uh, I mean, we should talk, you know, honestly about, you know, what type of, of societies they have. But I mean, I think the really important thing is, is, you know, are you are you for U.S., British, and French intervention, or are you against it? And on what basis are you against it? We're on, we're we were against the intervention of Libya and in Syria on the basis that these are countries that the U.S. are trying is trying to destroy and bring to their knees and establish as uh, uh, puppets, clients, servants. We're against that. That those are the U.S. and British and French aims, and their devices for doing that are trying to demonize the leaders of those countries using racist terminology in order to get us to, in order to get working people to go along with that. We're not for those racist demonization campaigns either. Plus, those are lies. I mean, they're grave mischaracterizations of the history of the people and of those countries and of the persons. So we see no reason to 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 join in that campaign. Um, you know, we don't think that North Korea is a um, is like a horrible dictatorship, and honestly, think that that is very correlative to like a racist campaign that the U.S. undertakes to isolate and demonize uh, the Korean people. Um, I mean, you know, if we don't have time, or I'd given us, I'd yeah, say what of. we think of exactly of Korea. I mean, if you want to stay around, I mean, I actually have to leave because I have to take over. Uh, um, care for my young child because my wife is a nurse and she has to go to work, but I can stay for a tiny little bit if people want to. 
I'm, I'm sure people may not want to hear anything else I have to say too. Uh, I wouldn't blame you. No, that's that's great. Thank you, John. Um, Thank you. Um, uh, yeah.